We are live. It's Dr. Jay here in the house with Evan Brand. Today, we are going to be having a podcast all about constipation and bowel motility issues. This is a topic that we deal with all the time with our patients, especially when we're dealing with and addressing potential infections. This can be a common side effect. So we're going to dive into the underlying mechanisms and what you can do, what we do about it with patients. Evan, what's going on, man? How are we doing? Doing really well. If someone listening is still embarrassed to talk about their poop, then I would encourage you to shed that, uh, sh shed the shame or embarrassment. We talk about poop all day. We love it. We enjoy it. This is part of being a human, number one, being a healthy human, number two, because if you're not pooping, you're reabsorbing toxins, whether that's xenoestrogens from environmental exposure or pesticide and herbicide or mold toxins. I mean, how we get rid of our toxic waste and chemicals and things we're making internally and that we're exposed to is peeing and pooping. And so when you look at someone who feels bad, they have dark circles under their eyes, they have skin issues, they're irritable, they're fatigued, they have headaches. A lot of times constipation is one of the underlying issues with those people. And if we can just get them pooping properly, good amount, good shape, good size, good consistency, good frequency, we can really increase their productivity, their energy, their mental cognition. We can get rid of sugar cravings. I mean, there's a lot that can happen when you just regulate the bowel. So we're going to dive in today on some of the big root causes, root triggers. I'm going to go straight to number one for me, uh, which is going to be gut infections. Now, you and I were just talking before we hit record about different gut bugs and how some people with IBS, they'll end up IBSC constipation, others end up IBSD diarrhea. And so depending on what type of infections you have, your bowels may become dysregulated. 100%. And so when you have different gut stressors, slow motility can easily be a result. So you can easily see on the, on the fast side, when motility is too fast, our body doesn't have the ability to reabsorb water and electrolytes in time, because usually electrolytes and water kind of follow each other. So as the colon kind of pulls out the electrolytes, usually the water comes out with it. And so when we have slower bowel movements, right, they're usually harder, more compact kind of stools. So if we look at like, for instance, the Bristol stool chart, I'll pull that up on screen. So anyone that's watching the podcast can take a look at it. Uh, the Bristol stool chart is a chart that's used by gastroenterologists and such, but it's just a way of kind of assessing where your stool fits. So the typical number four is like the poopy policeman. And that's like the, just the, the really good, solid looking snake, like not overly hard, not overly soft stool. That's number one. If you go to the actual number one on the Bristol stool chart, that's like kind of the rabbit poop, right? The rabbit pellets, really hard, hard to move. And then number seven is just pure liquid. And so four is kind of right in the middle and in between. So let me just show you what I'm talking about here. So you guys can visualize if you're watching the podcast video along with it. So here is the Bristol stool chart that you guys can see. Okay, so number one, right? Separate, hard clumps, nuts, hard to pass. This is like the rabbit poop, right? That's type one. And then it, it gently progresses back to two and three, right? Where it starts to get more sausage shape like, except, except it gets more smoother as it goes to three. And then step type four is the, the perfect poopy policeman, kind of more of a sausage like, um, more smooth, not overly cracked or not overly soft. And then you can see as you go to five and six, it becomes more liquid. And then seven is just entirely liquid, watery, no solid. And so that gives us a pretty good window. And so usually when we have, when the gut's really inflamed and we have usually a lot of toxicity in the gut, we can usually see it go to number seven where it's pure liquid. And that's because the body is just trying to flush things out. And when things go a little bit slower, you could still have inflammation and have type one, right? So you could have H. pylori, that's lowering stomach acid. You could have a lot of SIBO that is meth that's producing a lot of methane based back, uh, gases. And how do you know it's methane is you have a lot of foul smelling um, gas or flatulence. That's a sign that there's a lot, lot of methane present and methane can easily screw up that migrating motor complex and make the bowels go more on the slow side, but you can have the same level of infections like H pylori or maybe ehisto or giardia. And that could also cause it to go on the diarrhea side. So it just kind of depends. Everyone's a little bit different, but we always, you, you could have SIBO, you could have H pylori, you could have low enzyme and low acid levels that could easily be causing type one. But for someone else, those same infections could easily be driving steps type seven, right? Where it's pure liquid. So you got to look at everyone as an individual on that and really, you know, come up with the right plan. 
Yeah. And it can alternate too. Right. I mean, that yeah. was my situation when it can. I first had gut issues and I was losing weight uncontrollably when I had H pylori and parasites and bacterial overgrowth and candida, yep. the whole nine yards, you know, there'd be some days the gut was good. And most days the gut was not good. Luckily I'm over that now, but man, I'll tell you, I have a lot of empathy for people that, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get. You kind of wake up and it's like, is today a good day or not a good day? And you know, now that I've learned so much, you and I both over the past few years about mold toxicity, that's a big trigger for gut issues too. Some get constipated, but a lot have diarrhea. And I think that's the body's way of trying to get rid of the toxin, but also the gut is so irritated and you can have leaky gut from mycotoxin exposure that that can be a factor too. So eventually we'll get into the gut healing phase of our conversation. I think that's critical to healing constipation. 100%. And so on the constipation side, there could be issues with obviously the, the bowel motility has to be slow. So what's constipation? So if you're not having a BM, if you're not passing about 12 inches of stool in about a 24 hour period, that's typically constipation. And there are millions of people in this country that aren't able to have a BM every day. Now, once you start going two, three, four, five, six, seven, I've seen some patients that go up to seven days without a BM. That's a problem. Because half of your stool is going to be bacteria. The other half is going to be, you know, fiber and such. And within that stool, some of that bacteria and toxins needs to leave your body. If you're not having that pass through your intestinal tract into the toilet, your chance of reabsorbing a lot of those toxins goes up really high. That's definitely not good because those toxins get reabsorbed into your body. There could be xenoestrogens. There could be mold toxins. There could be a whole bunch of a junk in there that you could be reabsorbing and that could be really stressing out your body. So the first thing we talk about with detoxification is people talk about detox, 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 right? Well, if you're not pooping every day and that's because of a gut infection or not chewing your food well enough or having insufficient hydrochloric acid or enzyme levels or having some kind of a H. pylori or SIBO issue, all of those things can easily affect your detoxification. People are really focused on detox just by getting your digestion and your motility better. That makes a huge difference on your liver and all your detoxification pathways, your lymphatics, your immune, everything. Yeah. It's funny. You'll see women on Instagram. They're all done up their hair and their makeup and their lipstick. And they're like marketing hashtag ad hashtag detox hashtag T. And they've got these like I don't know, you know how it is, like these ridiculous products that they're marketing and they're not talking about poop. To me, that's the best way to detox is get poop out. I'm not going to buy a detox tea, maybe like a little bit of dandelion or some, who knows, milk thistle blended in. Yeah, I mean, that that's part of it. But unfortunately, detox has kind of gotten co-opted by the marketing industry. And so most people don't even focus on that. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll poop once a week, but then they take a detox tea and they think they're doing it correctly. Yeah. I mean, my, my whole take on detoxification out of the gates is very simple. Okay. First, get enough good, clean water in your system Two, make sure you're digesting your amino acids and all your nutrients. Well, remember sulfur based amino acids run the majority of your detoxification pathways along with B vitamins, right? So we need good B vitamins, good antioxidants, good sulfur amino acids. So if we're breaking down those nutrients well, there's not a bottleneck with HCL levels or enzyme levels, we're getting enough good clean water and we're not overly stressing our sympathetic nervous system. Because remember, the more we overly, overly stress the adrenals, the sympathetic nervous system decreases that migrating motor complex, which are the wave-like contractions that move stool through your intestinal tract. Just like you kind of roll up the toothpaste roll at night, to get that toothpaste moving through to get your toothpaste out to brush your teeth, your intestines do the same thing. So if you can do those top three things right, you're on the right track. Now, there may be extra things where we need extra sulfur or extra antioxidants or compounds or binders to help with mold or heavy metals. That's true. And that, that would be addressed down the road. But a lot of the toxification happens hepatobiliary, liver, gallbladder, back into the intestines and then out the intestinal tract. So we need to have really good motility and really good absorption of nutrients and a lot of good clean water to help fuel that. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. So we both manufacture our own custom blends of supplements that are professional grade. And we both have a liver support that has some gallbladder nutrients built into it. And that can be really helpful because 
as you mentioned, with sluggish bowels, a lot of times there's also sluggish bile production. So just helping to thin the bile, whether it's using supplemental ox bile or methionine, taurine, beet powder, whatever else we could do to increase bile flow, that's going to be helping. And then why don't we hit on the diet piece? I mean, I think this is the low hanging fruit that your average American is still really, really blowing it on, which is just the fact that they're not doing enough good meats, good fats, good veggies. You know, your average American might wake up and I don't know, do a piece of toast and maybe in 2020 or 2021, it's an avocado toast, but still, you know, that's not the optimal thing for good poops. Yes. Yeah, so inflammation in the diet can easily mess up the intestinal tract. Inflammation in the diet can easily create inflammation in the gut. And that could either move the, the body more to diarrhea or more to constipation. Now, for the sake of this podcast, if we start moving more to constipation, not good. Uh, and of course, you know, these foods can stress out the intestinal tract. And then when we start creating inflammation in the intestinal tract, and then we already have indigestion and we don't have adequate enzymes and acids. So we're kind of burping a lot after our meals, food sits longer in our tummy, right? And we're not in a lot of gases are produced because the foods are not being broken down properly. That's a problem. So we got to really make sure we're masticating and chewing our food very, very, very well. We got to make sure that increases surface area for enzymes and acids to work. We also have to make sure we're not overly hydrating with our meals. So hydrate 10 minutes or more before a meal. And then if you're consuming a little bit of liquid with a meal, just do it to kind of help with swallowing pills. Don't do it for hydration purposes because water's got a pH of seven and your intestinal tract's a pH of 1.5 to two. So if you start adding a whole bunch of seven pH to a, to a pH of two, you're going to move that pH more in the alkaline direction away from the acid direction. And we need good acidity to help activate our enzymes and our acid levels. Very important. So that's low hanging fruit is chew your food up well Second is make sure you're not overly hydrating with the food. Do all your hydration two minutes before. I've got on my grandfather so many times. He'll just drink liquid with almost every bite of his food. He'll just drink, oh. drink, drink, like take mm. a bite of food and wash it down with liquid. I'm like, no, I'm like you're literally just pouring water on your digestive fire. Don't do that. So yep. yeah, it's, it's easy and it, it actually does make a difference. I mean, you and I have probably talked about that before, but it does make a difference. Like if I, I've got a mason jar here, my goal, if I sit at the dinner table, I will try to not have it more than like two ounces of liquid. You know, if I have a full cup, I'm, I'm more, I'm liable to drink it. If I've just got a little bit, I know, Hey, this is the only liquid I have. If I need a little help with the meal, otherwise it's just food no liquid with the meal. Yeah. For me, as soon as I know, like a meal's coming, I'm going to go just maybe take two Mason jars, add some sea salt to it. I'm going to down them and then I'm good. And then, you know, five, 10 minutes later, I can start the eating process and I chew my food up very well. So then that gets the digestive juices rolling as well. So on top of that, another low hanging fruit is let's say you eat good quality proteins or fats, and that makes you constipated. That's almost a surefire sign. You're not making enough enzymes or acids. So some people, they really do poor with enzymes and acids, and it reveals itself through animal products. Now, a lot of people, when that happens, get what their natural tendency is. Unfortunately, oh, they're going to go, go vegetarian or... Yeah. Oh, it's the meat that's so bad for my guts. The meat that's in my intestinal tract for days and days. It's rotting in there. You know, oh, yeah. Documentaries. I have to cut out the animal products. Well, it's just a sign that your enzymes and your acids are really poor. And the meat is revealing that. Now, what's the solution? Now, in the meantime, you may want to drop down some of the meat that you're doing or some of the protein or fat you're doing just to kind of lessen some of the stress off the intestinal tract. But the first thing we'll do before that is we'll add in some HCL and some enzymes, maybe even some bile salts. We'll see how much that starts to correct it. And then if we need, then we can drop the animal protein and fat down a little bit if we need. Now, if your intestinal tract's really messed up, you may have to do an elemental or a bone broth fast or, or something more liquid based to make it easier on your intestines. So everyone's a little bit different. And we have a lot of clinical experience about being able to meet someone where they're at so we can get optimal results. Yeah. And it's sad that the meat gets the blame, you know, and all, like you said, all these documentaries that'll pop up on Netflix, they're all like majority, you know, anti-meat, vegetarian, vegan documentaries. And then you kind of have to help clients because sometimes we'll get clients that have not listened to enough of us where the, we haven't convinced them to get back on meat. I actually had a, uh, a vegan or ex-vegan client come to me last week. She said she was a vegan for six years and she got back on meat with the help of listening to our podcast. And she says she feels better than she ever has 
which is amazing. She was able to transition back onto meat without necessarily a bunch of supplemental enzymes. But in most cases, yeah, we're going to come in due to, and, and people may say, why, why do I need the supplement? Well, we don't live in a world where you're sitting on the edge of a cliff overlooking a river valley with no stress and, you know, hunter gather average work 18 hours a week. We're not doing that anymore. We're working 40, 60 hour work weeks. We've got kids, we've got technology, we've got smartphones taking our attention away. We're scrolling and bowling at Chipotle, looking at our phone while we're eating or we're, we're stressed from bills and mortgages and obligations and whatever. And age, by the time you're age 40, 50, 60, you're not making hardly any enzymes and acids compared to when you were younger. So all yes. those factors add up. That is the answer of why. Why do you need enzymes to support you and how do enzymes help you poop? Well, because when that food is digesting better, your body's going to be able to get rid of what it doesn't need. And if you have a lot of malabsorption problems, you know, you may see undigested food in the stool. And over time, I've noticed people just adding in a handful of berries a day was all we needed to really clear up their their issues. Once we got all the gut infections, enzymes in the, you know, in, infections resolved enzymes put in, if they still needed help, we'll go into a couple other things you want to get into, but a handful of blueberries. I mean, that does a lot. So it just kind of going back to some of the, the vegan stuff. So I always tell my patients, well, in general, I eat more non-starchy vegetables. Most paleo people eat more non-starchy vegetables than vegans do. Most vegans I find have lots of processed carbohydrate. They have lots of grains, lots of lentils or legumes, and they, they, they don't typically eat tons of non-starchy vegetables. It's, it's difficult on the vegan side. Most don't do it right. Now, if you're going to be a vegan, you, you need to do lots of good fats from avocado and coconuts, and you probably need some kind of an amino acid supplement from rice or pea protein or some kind of um, some kind of uh, an algae kind of protein source because most aren't doing it right if you're going to do it that way. Um, but number two is sometimes the vegetables can jack you up too, especially if they're raw because a lot of that fiber or if the vegetables are higher in fermentable carbohydrates, some can be like garlic and onions and, and broccoli and asparagus. They can be higher in FODMAPs. And FODMAPs can be fertilizer for a lot of the SIBO-based bacteria. So if you have a lot of bad bacteria that's producing maybe more methane, and some of those vegetables start to feed some of that methane producing bacteria that may make you more constipated too. So I've seen some patients do better more with the meats than with a lot of the plants. So I've seen it go both ways. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard because if you're, let's say you're one person and you had an experience where you went vegan and you felt great. Well, guess what? You only have your experience. I've seen patients that have gone carnivore and felt great. And so because we have this perspective where we've seen dozens of people do great from different things, that allows us to form a unbiased clinical recommendation on what we think is best for the patient because we've seen successes work from both sides. And the question is, we don't have a dogmatic belief in, oh, well, this is what does it. Well, this is why it would do it for this person. And this is maybe why it does it for you. And we're going to, we're going to move the levers around because the goal isn't to do this thing. It's to get you the results. So yeah. we, it's really important that if you're working with someone, you know, kind of talking to patients that are out there, you want someone, you want to work with someone that's results driven, not process driven, meaning, Hey, this, you have to do this diet. This is the most important thing. This should get you the results versus, Hey, no, I want to get you these results. We're going to try pulling some of these levers and see what happens as a result. And then we'll, we'll go backwards from there. So just really important. You want to make sure you're working with someone that's results driven, not necessarily, um, you know, dogma driven, if you will. That's another great soundbite. You're just rolling out these things. I love it. This is exactly the point that we needed to hit on because in this day and age, unfortunately, everything is kind of a soundbite. So you go to the lectin guy, you're going to get the lectin diet. You go to the carnivore guy, you get the carnivore diet. You go to the vegan guy, you get the vegan. And you and I don't really have any labels for us. We, like you said, we were results driven. And so we're able to be more flexible. I love that we're not in a box like these people, yeah. because once you write the carnivore book or the lectin book, you're kind of that guy. And then you're stuck in that box. And it's like, Oh, wait a second, I've got all these other people doing really good with some cooked lightly steamed veggies and, and blueberries over here, but you told me I need to be carnivore. So what the heck? And then it just blows your credibility. So I, yeah, I don't want to be in a box. Now I tend to, to lean more on the paleo template, but I use the word template, not diet. So I can have flexibility. And there's some patients that I've seen that haven't been able to tolerate any meat. And we've had to just lean on free form amino acids with some good 
vegetables or starches that are easy to handle. And I've had to go to that extreme with some patients. And if my dogma was, no, you must eat animal products all the time. Well, I may not have been able to help that person. So we try to have the levers that we work with. We kind of have like a foundational bias, but it's a bias that is flexible and that we can adjust according to the patient. Yeah. And eventually I would argue that that person you're referring to could probably get back in and they may yes. have been able to get back in not a the forever later. Mm-hmm. Not a for, That's the key. It's not a forever thing. It's kind of a starting point where, Hey, you break your ankle. You probably may have to be in a wheelchair out of the gates. And then we progress you to, you know, um, some crutches and then maybe put you on a boot and then you just maybe walk slowly. You don't run. And now you start jogging and now you start, right. There's a progression in how you, how certain things heal. Well, it's the same thing for your digestive system. That's not quite as outward. It's inward, right. And how it looks and performs, but you can feel it just the same as an outward injury to your foot or hand. Yeah, I'm going to keep this thing going a little more uh, philosophical than action-based for a minute just to to further this conversation, which is that let's say someone goes to the bookstore. Or, it's funny. Everything's changing with society, isn't it? Now it's the Amazon bookstore, the Kindle bookstore. Um, yeah. It used to be the real physical uh, brick and mortar if there's still any that exist out there. I know there are some. So you go into the store, right? And you go to the diet section and then someone picks up like a the, like I said, the paleo book, the lectin book, the carnivore book, they do that. And then they get different or weird results. And then they kind of just give up. And that's why they get so opposed to the word diet, or they get so opposed to the idea of changing the way they eat to change their symptoms. But the problem is, all these people writing these books are missing all the other root causes. So just because Jane didn't do well with a lot of meats, she might give up on meats, like you said, or she saw the documentary and give up on meats, but she never worked with somebody like us. So when we have these clinical tools that we have, where we're going to be measuring the stool, measuring the urine and looking at different infections, if we could just re- resolve those for Jane, get some of the enzymes back in, clear the infections, guess what? Now she does great with the meat. So it's sad because there's so many people that may have tried stuff like this, but they got so turned off with the non amazing results that they thought it was the diet to blame, but it wasn't. It was just the root causes. And like you said, the indicator is it's, it's sort of for us, it's a clue. Oh, that happens when you do meats. That doesn't mean give it up. That means let's figure out why. And the H. pylori piece yeah. could be the big one. It's true. And I call it the vegetarian or vegan honeymoon. A lot of people that do go vegan, they can feel great their first year. It all depends where they've come from. If they ate a lot of processed food or crappy food and they're eating lots of organic vegetables and and maybe some good healthy or plant fats like olives or, or avocado or coconut oil, and they're just getting a lot of organic food in their system, they may feel a lot better. Now, over time, as essential fatty acids and amino acids start moving more in the deficient side, and a lot of those fat-soluble vitamins like ADEK start moving downward, they'll start having more problems over time. And that's kind of, they call it the vegan honeymoon, where they're kind of chasing that honeymoon. They're like, oh, I don't feel as good as I did last year. And they kind of get stuck. And usually it's a protein fatty acid kind of issue, or maybe even a carbohydrate issue, too much carbs. And then you got to look deeper. So getting back to the constipation part, right? We have the six R's that I use to work with my patients. And we kind of start with that as a framework, removing the bad foods, replacing the enzymes and acids are the first two R's. And we adjust the diet accordingly. So it could be cutting out, cutting down a lot of the fiber or a lot more cooking or going lower FODMAP or cutting out salicylates or phenols or going autoimmune. It could be a combination of all of that. Could be an elemental diet. Of course, adding in enzymes and acids and bile, especially if the stools are floating more, that's a sign that we're not breaking down fats. We may adjust those first two R's. And if we're having bowel movement issues, I may add in things like ginger or bitters or D-limonene. We may have to even add in some natural things like trifolate or magnesium to really get the bowels moving. It just depends. I don't like to add in bowel movers unless I really can't move the bowels with those first two R's, right? If I can't move the bowels with those first two R's, changing the diet and changing enzymes, acids, and bile support, then we may lean on things to kind of get the bowel moving. But I always want to see how the body responds before we have to add those things in first. Well, you make a great point. And even clinically, the things you would recommend to be used directly for moving the bowels, those things are still a hell of a lot safer and more effective than some of the conventional stuff you're going to get. So, I mean, if you go to your conventional doc and they refer you to the GI doc and you're diagnosed with, let's say, IBSC, constipation, IBS type issue, 
there's going to be some type of a pharmaceutical involved and there's likely going to be side effects with that. And once again, it's not the root cause. So in your case, like you mentioned, clinically, you may not go straight to the magnesium hydroxide to help move the bowels by adding water to the bowels. However, there are so many people deficient in magnesium anyway, that you could be actually fixing simultaneously fixing an underlying mineral deficiency plus helping to move the bowel. So the cool thing about what we do is there are positive side effects and we can kill multiple birds with the same stone. Yes. I'd much rather use a nutrient than like an abrasive herb like Senna or Cascara Sagrada, right? No one has a deficiency of that, but they may have some deficiencies in some of these magnesiums that can be helpful. Now, if I get the bowels moving out of the gates, usually one or two months in, I'm going to try pulling back on some of these compounds to see if, if the bowels can move on its own. So it just depends, right? We're getting the body hydrated. We're, we're chewing better. We're working on eating in a non-stressful environment. We're getting enzymes and acids better. We're cutting out the inflammation and we may be changing some of the fermentability in the food. So all of those things, we're moving so many levers. So when I work with patients, patients are like, want to know like, well, what's the solution for this? What's the solution for that? It's like, I don't know. I'm going to just give you what I've seen to work and we're going to do eight or nine or 10 things out of the gate and we're going to see what works. But um, in general, to know exactly which one it is, it's really hard because you'd have to like make one change, wait a couple of weeks, make one change, wait a couple of weeks. And it would take patients years to get better versus weeks and months. And so we make a whole bunch of changes at once. And then we monitor and we check in on those changes. Yeah, good point. So just to give a little more clarity, if somebody's listening, like, what does that even mean? eight or nine changes. Oh my God, that's overwhelming. No, I mean, it could be, Hey, look, we're going to give a little more enzymes and acids. We're going to pull this food out. We're going to get you to do a little bit more water and a cleaner water source. We may throw in a little bit of this extra mineral or maybe a little extra vitamin C. You're going to do a handful extra of some blueberries. You're going to make sure you're getting enough adequate movement because you're a sedentary job. So we're going to get you a, a standing desk and now you can stand up and move around. We're going to get you to do a 10 minute walk a day. We're going to get you to you know, take a couple deep breaths. We're going to get you to chew your food better. We're going to make sure food. that you're yeah. not sitting in, I don't know, a crazy loud restaurant with like, you know, speakers yeah. blasting, you know, techno music in the background. We want you to just settle down. We want you to yeah. go to bed on time. I mean, yeah. those things give you five, 10, 15%. And then by the time you add it all up, you've got really good success. Yeah. And you're not chewing your food. I'm sorry. You're not hydrating when you're eating, right? All these things matter and maybe getting a little bit more sunlight, right? All these things matter. And so that's why it's so hard to be like, well, what's the solution for this? It's like, well, there's a lot of things that can be a contributing factor. It could be 10% for this, 5% for that, 20% for that. It's very rare that the, uh, this one thing is 80, 90, hundred percent. Sometimes you get bait, like you just make one simple change and then you, the next week you check in with the patient and they're like, well, I'm 80 or 90% better. It's like, whoa, that's a home run that can happen too, but we don't count on it. And that's why we, we do things kind of in a systematic fashion of what's going to be the low hanging fruit. And then we kind of move up from there, right? You got to build up the foundation of the house. Once the foundation's solid, now you can, you can build up, but the foundation's yeah. not solid. Then you have a whole bunch of problems that hap happen with, with the building of the house as you start going up. Good point. Good point. And this is the whole reason that we do a workup and we run people through a sort of a system. You call it a system approach because if you come in and you go to the doc, hey, I've got constipation, pharmaceutical laxative, see you later. If you come to us, constipation, it's like, hmm, interesting, interesting. Okay, let's figure out why. And if you ask why enough and you do the proper testing, you're going to get to that why. So I just want to make sure we're always comparing and contrasting because you ask, you know, Bobby, who hasn't pooped all week, what he's going to do for his constipation, he might go to Walgreens, he's going to go to the laxative section, oh, he, I found this laxative, this one looks good, let me drink some of this stuff, oh yeah, I pooped, problem solved, it's like, mm, yeah, you solved the constipation problem, but you didn't solve why that's happening in the first place, so I just, it shouldn't have to be revolutionary to think root cause, but it still is not the mainstream, so until it's the mainstream, our job is not done. Yeah. And so when you, for most conventional, like gastro people, for instance, they're just like, Hey, motility support, here you go. Laxative support, here you go. It's very rare. You, you may get one that say, Hey, let's do a SIBO breath test. Maybe that. And, and then what after that, maybe they're going to just recommend, Hey, you know, do this quick little diet thing. Cause a lot of the conventional FODMAP diets still have a lot of grains and other crap in there. So you may not change the inflammation and they may throw some rifaximin or neomycin at you 
boom. And then, then maybe you have a fungal overgrowth or something on the backside because they don't do or address the gut bacteria right. And then that can create other rebound overgrowth down the road. So let's say you have a very progressive kind of forward thinking gastro doc. Maybe that's what happens that I just mentioned. But most it's going to be, hey, here's your motility enhancer. And, you know, you got to just learn to relax and, and meditate. And, hey, maybe take an antidepressant a lot of time. That's it. So you're kind of stuck. And that's just the insurance-based model. When you have three to five minutes with a doc, that's typically all they're going to recommend for you. They don't have enough time to really dive in deeper. And that model doesn't give them the ability to dive in deeper. So you really need to see a functional medicine doctor to really have the ability to go deeper and get to the root cause. Yeah, I get so frustrated with that term integrative. It just makes me angry because I've had so many people, and I know you have too, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients and patients that have said, I've worked with this integrative guy. I'm like, oh, integrative, what did he do? And you know, they, they kind of market it as it's like so forward thinking. But like you said, it may be the rifaximin at most. And then guess what? A lot of these people, they have antibiotic resistant infections. So we'll test them. And guess what? The SIBO situation is still going on. Maybe they have parasite to, like you said, there's a fungal overgrowth component to it as well. Their gut's leaky, their gut's inflamed. Now they've got all sorts of other problems as a side effect of hitting this rifaximin. In some cases, it can help maybe play whack-a-mole a little, it may knock some things down, but they still have enough problem when they come to us that we need further work. So I get frustrated with this integrative idea because, and I know there's good intention behind it, but as you mentioned with that model, the way the model exists, it doesn't, it doesn't allow enough time and there's not enough um, advanced testing like we're doing to, to fully get to the yeah, bottom of it. Correct. And once you kind of talk to your conventional medical doctor and you say, hey, walk me through your thinking on what you think the root cause of this could be. Usually it kind of reveals there that they really don't know. Because if you're just providing a drug to treat the symptoms, well, obviously they're not worried about the root cause because it's, it's Band-Aid down below, right? So we kind of look at everything in my line kind of as the SSS approach, right? You have the underlying stressors here, could be physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress, food allergies, bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, right? All of these stressors increase our stress bucket and then the body systems start to dysfunction. Hormones, digestion, immune, detoxification. As these systems start to dysfunction, then you have all this, the, the symptoms happen down below. And so conventional medicine just band-aids these symptoms down below. They don't ever go upstream. So you got to have conversations with your doctors that talk more about the upstream issues. And so we try to nullify all of the underlying stressors, make sure food's good, chewing's good, hydration's good. And then we're going to do tests that look at the function of these systems. So it's a lot different of approach. So if you're working with someone, you know, you want to be able to ask the right questions. What do you think the underlying root causes are? And as a patient, make sure you walk into it with an open mind that there's probably not one underlying issue. It's probably a bunch of things that are spread out that are part of the underlying cause from the stress standpoint and the body system standpoint that are emanating the symptoms downstream. Yeah, well said. Well said. That's a great, great visualization. And you have permission to have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things going on. That's so. the key. That's that that's the missing assumption. You can have a lot of different things. And then as you walk through with the clinician and you're making changes, you need to not go into it as, oh, I made this diet change and this supplement, and I don't feel better yet. It's okay. There's always a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, a plan E. And if the answer is down here in E and F and you, and you quit and get discouraged that B and C, then you never get a chance to kind of go deeper. So just as patients are listening here, always make sure you, you have that ability to kind of just like have a good attitude and keep on progressing down the line. Yeah. And you can't blame them. I mean, this is the way that people have been conditioned over decades and decades of conventional medicine, but it still does frustrate me when someone will approach us, whether it's a friend or a family member or something, and they'll say, Hey, you know, I've got autoimmune, I've got Sjogren's or I've got alopecia, or I've got, you know, diabetes type two. What's wrong with me? Like, why did this happen? Where did this come from? It's like, where do I even start? You stay up till 1 a.m., you posted a picture the other day on your Facebook page of you eating an ice cream sundae. Uh, you never get exercise. I know what you do. You, you sit all day. You don't get outside. I, you, you've never had a tan in your life, so you're afraid of the sun. If you do go outside, you lather yourself in sunscreen chemicals. You don't eat organic. You're super stressed. I mean, you know, so when people ask, well, what's wrong? Why is this happening? It's almost like, uh-oh, are you ready for this? Because I'm about to open up 
Pandora's box here. And I'm going to tell you 20 things of what's happening. I'm going to tell you 30 things of why this has happened to you. So it's just a re-education really of telling people, look, it's, there's not a one smoking gun. Rarely do you and I find one smoking gun. Yep. I a hundred percent agree. It's nice every now and then where you kind of get a home run in functional medicine, when you kind of make a couple of changes and it's like, boom, and you blast it out of the park. It's always a good, like little ego check. Cause you know, you work with a lot of difficult patients over, over time. And so it's nice to get a couple of home runs every now and then. But if you work with a good clinician that has the right algorithm and kind of goes through the things, goes to the options that give you the greatest chance of success out of the gates, and then works to the things that give you the less success at the end, then you have the greatest chance of success as a patient early on and, and you set the foundation for greater healing over time. So I think that's really the most important mindset is clinically go with the high percenter options. Yeah. And I'm not being a bully here and I'm not making fun of these people. I'm just saying we really need a re-education. You know, you, you, people eventually come out of the woodwork at, at you when you and I do what we do and they're not ready for the red pill. They're not, you know, they'll ask, what's wrong with me? Why do I have diabetes? Or why do I have this headache? It's like, ah, are, are you ready? Are you ready? Because there's, there's a lot to uncover. There's a lot to unpack. Yeah. I, I think most people, once they've kind of gone through the conventional medicine model and they've kind of said, Hey, well, all right, well, I just don't want to be relying on laxatives or enemas my whole life. What's next. Usually once there's, they kind of have this level of like, okay, these are the only options I have from conventional medicine. There's a level of openness that occurs from that where they're like, all right, what's next? What's next? Cause I see functional medicine and nutritionists helping people all the time. What's next outside of this? Cause they just kind of have this yearning that there's gotta be something more. And I think that's creates a level of openness and readiness too. Good point. Good point. Yeah. I often say people have to hit rock bottom or they have to be miserable enough to listen. I mean, you and I've heard countless stories of husbands and wives that are stubborn and they want to eat the pizza while the other spouse has to eat the grass fed steak and sweet potato, that grass fed steak, sweet potato tastes better anyway. So I don't know what they're they're doing, Uh, but, but anyway, they've got to have their own issue. Right. And then finally, once the other person, once they get miserable enough, then finally they're, they're willing and you don't have to drag them into this whole thing as much. No, I totally agree. Well, if you guys are listening and you enjoy the, the podcast here, put your comments down below, really appreciate the thumbs up and a share. We also reviews are great. Justinhealth.com slash iTunes, Evan Brand. Uh, dot com slash iTunes. It's great. You know, if you feel free to he- head over to evanbrand.com, you can schedule an appointment with Evan anywhere in the world, <laughs> vice versa with myself, Dr. J at justinhealth.com. We're here to help y'all and uh, appreciate you guys listening and just feel free to share this content with some friends or family that can benefit. Again, we're clinicians that have had tens of thousands of patients experience kind of combined, and we want to provide actionable information with y'all so you can take action and get your health back in your hands. So we really appreciate you guys being uh, listeners and attending. Take great care of yourself. We'll be back next week. Thanks.